Welcome back, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about how to quantize the classical walk that we talked about last time. And in particular, the construction that I'm going to be kind of reviewing, at least at a high level, is was originally due to Mario Zegedi, um, who uh, came up with a, this really elegant way of quantizing a classical walk and actually allowing us to, um, uh, in the process, be able to actually generalize the search out, uh, idea behind the search algorithm to a far larger family of uh, particular problems that we can solve. So uh, without further ado, let's let me share my screen and then we'll get started. So the basic idea behind uh, behind walk algorithms, if you recall, is normally when we're approaching a walk algorithm, we might have some, you know, graph, say something, I don't know, like this, then we could have a link there and maybe it terminates. And the basic idea is that what we would like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to explore this graph using a walker. And the walker um, is set up at an individual vertex, at least in a classical case, and then is allowed to transition to each of the um, uh, individual vertices. Now the vertices all have different labels. I'll, let's call the starting vertex the start vertex. Now, the rest of these vert vertices, it's really key to, to make sure that you always keep this in your head, but the rest of these vertices, the labels are not known a priori. So the label for this vertex might be 42. This one could be, um, I don't know, uh, 127. This one could be 39. There's really no rhyme or reason or promised pattern to the labels other than the fact that all of the vertex labels are distinct. Now there's various tasks that we could potentially want to do for this, but let's uh, here, we're, uh, just like we discussed last time, we're gonna primarily be looking at applications that resemble the search problem. So in particular, we're going to assume that a grand total of M of these, there's a, okay, there is a set M over here, and this is the set of marked, vertices and the size of the set is we'll, we'll just denote to be absolute value of m. Uh, furthermore, we're going to assume that there are n uh, vertices in total. Okay, so the basic idea here is that if what we uh, if we could set up, a probability distribution that you know was kind of classically, if it was uniformly distributed over the graph, then we could figure out what the marked elements were just by statistically sampling. Quantumly, we'd like to be able to do something similar, but get there faster. Now, in the classical case, for simplicity last time, we made a couple of assumptions uh, that were key. The first one that we ended up assuming is we assumed that our graph is K regular. Um, actually, I think we called it deregular in that context, but the basic idea is, is that every vertex has degree D, which means that there are uh, exactly uh, D edges out of each uh, vertex. And as a notational thing, uh, I should mention that we are always going to refer to our graph as being the um, a, a tuple between a vertex set V and an edge set E. Okay, so I'll often when I whenever I say that something is in the edge set E, I mean that you know that specifically we have a tuple of points A B such that that tuple of points. A, B has an edge in it, which I will write as A, B is in the set E. Okay, so that is the basic idea of, um, of just the notation that we're gonna be using, but let's think about how to quantize it. Now, there were a number of approaches originally that, uh, that were taken involving the use of a coin. Um, they're, they're kind of nice um, conceptually, but one of the problems is that they're a real pain to analyze. 
So Zegedi's uh, approach to this actually was va vastly simpler to analyze. And this approach basically kind of flips the script a little bit. The basic idea is that instead of imagining the walker as being at a, a particular vertex, now what we do is we kind of think about the walker on an edge of the graph. And then what we, uh, the way that we keep track of this is we just watch the walker as they progress through the entire graph. Okay, so before proceeding, what we uh, for this problem of trying to find a marked element here, um, let's break it up into uh, two particular sets. Let's assume that we've got the set of good states, which is defined to be one over square root, the size of the number of marked elements, times sum over the vertex vertices x in the marked set x times this quantity sum over y such that the um vertex ver the edge x y is in the edge set and then we're going to weight that with the transition probability p x y y where PXY in our context, we're because we're not assuming it's K regular, this could be an arbitrary probability distribution, a subject to the constraint, of course, that uh, the sum over Y, PXY is equal to one for all X. And we needed that, if you recall, in order to ensure that the probability distribution remains a probability distribution under the walk. So that's the, the, the and in, in our context, of course, uh, we'll also need this because of the fact that it guarantees that the, the resulting distribution is a valid quantum state. So that's our good, uh, set of good states. And similarly, there's going to be a set of bad states, which are defined to be one over square root of n minus the size of the marked state, the sum over all x's that are not in the marked uh, set of marked states, and the corresponding edges going out from this square root p x y and y. So in particular, the good states over here, you can envision the good states as being, okay, so let's imagine that good is like green. Okay, the good states would be quantum superpositions over the edges that are adjacent to this. So the walker in the good subspace will be in a superposition over being at the mark state and one of its neighbors. And that's exactly what this G uh, is doing over here. And the bad states, which we'll call which we'll label in, in B, will be the states that don't uh, correspond to the walker being on an edge that doesn't have a marked state adjacent to it. Okay, so that's what the G and B subspaces are. They're a quantum superposition over all of those potential good edges with the corresponding weights that we end up getting from PXY, where again, PXY is the classical transition probabilities that we would have for the analogous um, classical walk operator. Okay, so that is how the whole whole thing is set up. Now, the the next uh, object that we I'd like to uh, introduce is the object U over here, and U is actually uh, defined uh, to be the following. It's defined to be the quantum state. Um, square root of m divided by square root of n g plus square root of n minus the size of the marked uh, system divided by square root n times b. Okay, so that is the state u corresponding, uh, corresponding to this. How do we need to go through, um, so now that we've defined uh, U, we can kind of ask ourselves, all right, well, how are we going to approach this? Well, looking at U, what we can see over here is that if we wanted to find a marked state, 
all that we would need to do is project yourself down into one of these edges. If we check then both of the vertices adjacent to any of the positions that the green person is at, then we'll find the marked state with certainty if we're lucky enough in order to project ourselves down onto the good subspace. So this really now actually looks just like um, amplitude amplification. So the high level algorithm, al, uh, al, uh, works as follows. Um, assume um, you can um, prepare the state U uh, and apply uh, an operation, uh, let's call it RU, such that RU uh, uh, is equal to identity minus twice U, U, okay? Uh, as well, as a um, as well as a, a, an oracle that um, will map um, x to um, negative one to the x in M. X. Okay, so given the uh, these these two two objects, then what we have is uh, the the following. Or actually, let's simplify our oracle a little bit from this. So let's assume that our oracle will take uh, an edge x y, which is equivalent to this over here. Okay, so let's assume that we have one or potentially two marked elements. Maybe this one's marked over here. Then this, uh, this will map this to uh, negative one to the um, x or y is in, um, or sorry, I guess I should say it should map it to negative one to the x or y. Uh, sorry, x in the mark set or y in the mark set. And the, we assume this uh, this oracle for simplicity can be, yeah, obviously be be constructed from the fundamental oracle using uh, two queries, uh, two, two fundamental oracle that just tests membership of one using two queries, some, uh, some Hadamard operations and a little bit of uncomputation. So let's just assume we have this, this oracle and I'll call this Oracle OM. Then our high level algorithm will work as follows. We'll be, construct an operation that I'll call W0 and W0 is just going to be of the form of the R0 operation followed up by the marking oracle. This over here, we can end up seeing is exactly the same thing as uh, same as amplitude amplification. And so going through the analysis of amplitude amplification, we can end up saying, okay, well, let's then define theta to be equal to the um, arc sine of a uh, square root of uh, M over N. Then in that case, we have that U is equal to sine theta G plus cosine theta B. Okay, and then from the exact same analysis that we uh, use, uh, um, that we showed in a previous 
uh, lecture on amplitude amplification, we have that W0 to the pth power acting on the U state then is equal to sine of 2p plus 1 theta g plus cosine 2p plus 1 theta b. Now, assume theta is known. Uh, if not, then uh, we can use um, the exponential um, search uh, uh, algorithm to uh, find in the same time. Alternatively, another approach that can be used is the quantum singular value transformation can be used in order to actually boost the probability to nearly 100% through a technique that is often called oblivious amplitude amplification. <clears throat> so there's a couple of ways of doing this. But for simplicity, we're just going to assume that, that it's known. So if it's known, then what we uh, the value of p that we'll want to set will be found by setting p to be approximately equal to pi over um, 4 theta. Okay, so that is the value that we'll end up finding. And this means that the number of W0 operations is in order one over theta, which is the exact same thing as order square root n over m which is totally unsurprising because that's basically the exact same scaling that we would get out of Grover search. And this is essentially entirely Grover search. So you might be wondering, okay, well, where does the magic come in? Well, magic will come in in just a sec. So give me a little, a little bit of patience here. So with W0, there are two operations in W0. We had um, the number of um, Oracle queries queries uh, to, uh, to end up implementing this is going to be uh, equal to three times the uh, number of queries that we needed. The reason why is that if we, using our a, a unitary method for preparing U, we can do the reflection using two queries to transform this into um, uh, some operation the uh, of the form u u identity minus two zero zero u u dagger where u u is defined to map zero to u okay so if we have an oracle uh, that can pair it then we can use that in order to build a reflection in two queries using the exact same type of stuff that we've uh, uh, seen uh, through amplitude amplification. Specifically though, if uh, what this whole process would end up looking like is it would end up looking like the um, following. If we have some arbitrary quantum state coming in, psi, we would then have um, u, u dagger over here. And then what we'll do is we will have a maximally controlled Toffoli gate going down to an ancillary qubit that we initially set to be zero. Now this extra qubit is actually totally unnecessary, but I'm putting it in just because of the fact that it's kind of easier to see this. Now, if we do that, this qubit will be one if and only if the top qubit registers is all zeros, uh, which is one if and only if psi is equal to u. And we wanna be, uh, reflect about this case. So if it's one, if and only if that's the case, then we can build a reflection by putting a Z poly Z gate in. And then we'll correct that by doing this. And then finally, we've got to transform out of this basis by applying a the last you use. So this is the, um, that's how we could end up doing this with two 
queries to you, uh, you. And as as always, we assume that UU is um, is it is invertible. So single query to UU can all, is also equivalent to querying its inverse. All right. So the number of Oracle queries then is three times the number of W O, which it, because three is just a constant factor, this is again in order n over n. But the real question is how to prepare you. Okay, so that that is that is a real um, yeah interesting and kind of kind of fun question about all of this. So. We can do all of this if we can make it, but the problem is that unlike amplitude amplification, like ordinary amplitude amplification, what we would have is we would have some initial state that we, we would like to prepare, which is often going to be a uniform superposition. Like for example, for the Grover application, the analog of U is Hadamard tensor n acting on zero, which is just sum over j, one over root two to the n of j. Okay, so the big difference here is that in that case, we knew all of these individual uh, labels. So the labels are known. In our context, we don't even know the labels that are on the graph. So how do we build this uniform quantum superposition? Well easiest thing we could do is we could actually just go back to the graph, right? And classically traverse it. But if we classically traverse it, then we have to query every single vertex that's in the graph, which is going to take time, order the size of the graph. And that is something actually that's just going to utterly kill the performance of our algorithm relative to classical, because we're going to have to classically search the entirety of the graph before we can even run our quantum algorithm. So this is something that kind of stymied some of the early attempts in order to be able to make um, this whole idea end up working. So the trick, and this is like the high level, um, <laughs> too long didn't read part about this, is that we define a quantum walk operator that reflects about the uniform superposition of all uh, edges in uh, incident to each vertice vertex. or to, uh, uh, sorry, uniform superposition of all vertices in some sense, not edges. Uh, adjacent to each edge. So the basic idea here is how does this end up working? Well, we've got, imagine we've got an edge, okay? That we're, uh, uh, that, uh, that's of interest. And the walker is sitting at the edge. Now, let's say that we've got, I don't know, three and two coming out the other side. So what will happen in this particular case is that we, the way the algorithm works is we, first, we are going to take, let's say, call, I'll call this one X and Y. What we're going to do is we're going to um, begin by um, taking x to be fixed, then reflecting about all of the uh, uh, adjacent neighbors y. Or sorry, I guess we'll take x to be fixed like this. And then what we will do is we will reflect for the left endpoint, we'll reflect about all of its neighbors, which would be all of these. 
Similarly, then in the next step, what we'll do is we'll take y to be fixed. And then what we'll do in the second step is we'll reflect about all of those possible states. And these two operations I'm going to call um, RA and RB. And these two put together are going to form our quantum walk for it. So let me just define a little bit more notation for this. So let's define in particular um, a set, the set A to be equal to the span of all vectors of the form x as sum over y such that x y is at the edge set of square root p x y y. Okay, and so to get to get for for the case of the the the, the this ab a graph above, x would be you know for example the the node that we're focusing on in this definition. And then all of these y's would be the vertices in the green circle over here. Okay. And B, we're going, we're going to define another set B very similarly. It's going to be defined to be the same thing, except we're going to be doing this on the opposite register. So now we're going, I, I'm going to define this to be the uh, sum over. Uh, x such that x y is in the edge set of x square root p x y, recalling that you know this um, yeah. So p uh, and then what we have is we have that this is the sum over uh, all y. So these two operations essentially end up looking like um, swaps of each other. So, and the other way, the way that you can interpret this is imagine that these are the left vertices in the edge, and these ones are the right vertices for some canonical ordering. And then, and then these two um, 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 operations then, or these two sp vector spaces are going to be all possible linear combinations of, uh, uh, of these things. And so we're now going to um, define the, our operators RA such that RA um, maps, um, okay, Ket x to um, negative x if and only if x is in, I should say, um, what's the right way of putting this? Um, psi maps to minus psi if and only if psi is in A. And our B, it will map similarly psi to minus psi if and only if psi is in b furthermore we're going to uh, end up defining um, all, a preparation operation that will help us uh, implement these this preparation operation we're going to define to be ul which is ul prepares the uh, right um, vertex superposition given left. And so the way that UL ends up working is that UL specifically acting on the X uh, index in the left, which is why I use the L on this, uh, then zero over here will end up preparing x, the sum over y, in, um, such that x, y is in the edge set of the graph. Then this will be, of course, square root px, y, y. Okay.
Cool. So what's the way to think about UL? The way to think about UL is that you could think about UL as being kind of like a classical, uh, the, uh, the, a superposition of the classical walk, where now we have a walker that's at a vertex X, and then we'll walk with appropriate probabilities to each of the neighboring vertices. So this is really a, a classical walk in the superposition. And then you are, on the other hand, unsurprisingly, is going to have the exact opposite definition. It'll take you uh, this over here and map that to uh, the sum over x such that x, y is in E of x square root p x y and then y over here. Wonderful. And then with these two operations, we can end up actually building R A and R B. Uh, R A is actually then equal to identity minus uh, twice the um, U, U L um, times identity tensor zero zero U L dagger. And similarly, our B is identity on the whole space minus twice U R identity on uh, part of the space tensor zero on the part that we actually want to uh, flip U R dagger. And so why does this end up working? Well, let's say that I've got the um, state uh, in, in a, so the states in A are a span of states that are in uh, the, the form sum over x uh, such that, or y, such that y, x, y is in the edge set, p, x, y, y. All right. So this, of course, is equal to you are acting on a zero or acting on x, zero. So all we need to do in order to be able to check to see if we're in the span is that we can take the state, which I'll call psi over here. And if we map psi to uh, u r dagger psi, then this will just give us x and zero. So this qubit register will flag and tell us whether or not the, um, the qubit is zero. And that's what this algorithm, the sub algorithm is doing up here. It's just checking to see whether or not that, uh, that register is zero after we uh, strip away the UR and the UL. Oh, uh, actually, sorry. I think I meant UL here. It's a problem. I think I chose the exact op opposite definition I should have when, uh, when I was using right and left, but uh, oh well. So. The, now, what we're, um, the next step in all of this is, of course, we're going to build the quantum walk operator, which I alluded to before, is just the reflection operator, uh, R-A-R, uh, or R-B-R-A. Okay. And so this part over here, the analysis gets a little bit involved. If you want to verify this, the right place to take a look at is uh, look at Zegedee's uh, on, um, uh, on walks. But in any case, the key thing is that the eigenvalues uh, for W1, which is often written as W1 of the, uh, the probability matrix or the transition matrix for the classical walk, the eigenvalues of these are all of the form R e to the plus minus arc two arc cosine and I here of um, theta sub j. So, or sorry, I should say they're all of the form uh, two arc cosine 
of um, lambda j, where lambda j is the jth eigenvalue of p. Now, we know from um, last time that the largest lambda is one and it is um, and it corresponds to the equilibrium distribution. And further, it is unique. Uh, and all other eigenvalues, lambda uh, uh, j uh, minus lambda one, satisfy that the gap between the uh, between them is greater than or equal to delta. Okay, and this delta over here again is often called the um, spectral gap of the walk operator. And it unsurprisingly, just as it did for the classical algorithm, the spectral gap ends up dictating how expensive the uh, the procedure is going to be in order to um, in order for us to be able to uh, essentially figure out how to use this W one operation in order to be able to prepare uh, the state U that we needed for the outer algorithm. So that's the spectral gap that we're um, that we're we're looking at. And so the strategy, oh, I should, I should say before getting into the strategy, um, the also we can end up seeing that w one of p acting on u equals u. And so this implies that the largest eigenvalue uh, corresponds to u. And this leads to then the, the, the following uh, uh, algorithm. So what the algorithm works as follows. Um, one, uh, apply, um, prepare some kind of a state uh, that has um, ideally order one overlap with you, okay? This can often be done by just by creating a um, um, naive walk that ends up going for a fixed number of steps inside the, um, the original space. And then we can basically use that in order to try to, to probabilistically uh, project onto you. Two, we apply um, phase estimation um, on you with the unitary W1. And so what this recall will look like, again, if you recall, we'll have a state like zero, zero, going all the way down. We had our transform, all of these guys. We'll take our quantum state, which is initially like psi over here. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and apply this, the, our quantum walk operator going all the way down to W to the two to the N minus one. And then we inverse QFT it. And the resulting register up here, if zero or approximately zero, then uh, we get U. 
And so that is how, how we end up doing it. In practice, we know that the eigenvalue gap is delta. And so by choosing our, um, a, by, by defining our success to be any value which is less than delta, then we'll be, we'll be good. So this process can be used in order to prepare you. N then once we've, uh, uh, we've got this process, let's call uh, this over here, um, QPE of uh, W1. Then our circuit, we can envision a, a circuit for our entire algorithm that would end up looking like this. We feed in psi and zero up here, and I'm also going to feed in zero down here. We'll apply QPE W1. Then what we'll do is we will um, compare, or actually let's put, let's put the zero up on top. That way I don't have to use any funky notation. Then what we'll do is we'll just make a classical arithmetic circuit to compare um, QPE um, W1, like the angle with it, to um, compare a QPE to the value of a zero. Technically speaking, we're not going to want it to be precisely zero because of the fact that there's going to potentially be errors, small errors in our phase estimation protocol. But if uh, uh, we'll define this such that this qubit, and I'll, we'll be more clear about what we mean here, will be one if the error is small relative to um, the spectral gap, and meaning that. If our error is small, right, and we have all of our different eigenvalues corresponding to um, this over here is going to be like arc cosine of um, one. And the next one that we have to worry about disambiguating between is going to be like arc cosine of one minus delta. And so if we choose our error tolerance such that all the correct values will be worst case scenario on a success branch halfway between the two then we would choose uh, this to be one if and only if the value is inside this gap up here. And that's what I mean by set it one to be equal to that. Now, this is clearly a polynomial time, uh, there's, clear, there's clearly a polynomial time classical algorithm for implementing this because the uh, arc cosine function is efficiently uh, computable. So we can just take a classical circuit from doing that and it won't require any queries. So from the perspective of query complexity, we just don't care about this cost but of implementing this. But I just wanted to be clear that we need some kind of a comparison here in order to make that work. Then what we need to do is, we, well, if this is one, then we've got the U state. So we're just gonna apply Z then to that qubit. We'll then undo the comparison and then we will undo the quantum phase estimation, okay? And that is the final step in, in, in our algorithm uh, for doing RU, okay? So RU, the cost of RU is going to be um, two times the cost of so then the biggest question that we're going to have to ask is, all right, well, what kind of precision are we going to need on phase estimation? Because the, with phase estimation, the, um, the cost is going to be order log one over the probability of failure. I'm going to drop this for the purposes of simplicity, um, divided through by the, um, Let's call it epsilon precision. Just to be very clear that you know this is that that's the uh, that's what we want here. And so the question is, all right, well, how bad can can our two functions uh, uh, differ from each other? Well, we have that uh, the two the two potential phases 
are going to be, um, right, the, the difference between the phases is the following. It is going to be two arc cosine of um, one minus two arc cosine of one minus delta. Okay, cool. So this over here can be simplified because the arc cosine of one is zero. So this is actually just going to be equal to twice the absolute value of the arc cosine of one minus delta. But the arc cosine of one minus delta actually uh, can be written as the sum over uh, two delta plus root two delta to the three halves over 12 plus sum of a whole bunch of other terms. All of these contributions turn out to be greater than or equal to zero. So what this ends up meaning is that the difference between the phases is uh, greater than or equal to um, two root two delta, which is also greater than root two delta. And of course, I guess ultimately, uh, the simplest expression is it's lower, to, lower bounded by root delta. Okay, so that is the, um, um, difference between the phases. And so this means that if we go back to the gap up here, that this between here and here is actually at most square root delta. So we're going to want to pick uh, epsilon precision for our purpose to be say less than or equal to root delta over two just to make sure that we can unambiguously discriminate between here and here. If I chose it to be root delta down at the bottom, then actually because of the failure probability, we would need to have zero failure probability in order to be able to make that work. And that of course would lead to an infinite computational cost unless the uh, success probability happens to be a root of two pi. So that is the, um, or root of, a, uh, root of unity like we ended up seeing for the cases where phase estimation is exact. So if that is the um, um, precision, then the cost of PE neglecting failure probability is order uh, one over root delta, okay? And furthermore, the cost of, um, of um, the reflection about the unit U, which was this circuit up here, required two calls to that. So as mentioned, this is in order two over root delta. But because big O notation drops all constant factors, this is exactly the same uh, thing is order one over root delta. Now, the number of RU that we uh, ended up needing in um, our algorithm uh, in the W1 or W0 algorithm was square root n over uh, uh, m. And so this implies that the query complexity is in order square root n, n over m root delta, okay? Whereas if we take a look at the case of a classical walk, um, Assuming that we had a uh, D regular graph, the cost of, uh, of, of us doing that was in order n m uh, quadratic speed up. 
And well, we only showed a quadratic speed up in the case of the deregular graph here. The exact uh, uh, more complicated arguments can end up it be, uh, can be used in order to be able to show that this quadratic speed up actually is more generic and uh, works also for um, arbitrary uh, graphs, not just the deregular ones. So this gives us, to recap, this basically how the Zegedy walk ends up working is, again, you know, we had some, uh, a marked element, let's say that one over here. And what we want, the way that this algorithm ends up working is we, we reduce it to grow uh, to something that looks very much like Grover's search. But in order to make, uh, uh, make it work, what we need to be needed to be able to do is we needed to be able to construct this reflection about um, the initial state. And this is the initial state U, which um, was given by the uh, quantum superposition over both the good and the bad states up here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right here. And so we wanted to be able to prepare uh, this guy. And so we can showed that by carrying out this procedure that involves reflecting, putting a walker on each of the sites and reflecting about the um, neighbors of the right uh, one and then uh, the left one in alternating order, then these end up actually lead it, causing the walker to end up uh, exploring this graph um, relative, in a relatively nice way that we can actually analyze and show that the eigenvalues needed for this are um, related to the eigenvalues of the graph. Then by using phase estimation, we were able to carry out these reflections about this state U, despite the fact that we don't actually know the labels for everything thus allowing us to apply Grover's search in circumstances where we don't actually even know the labels of all the vertices that are present in the problem. And this fact that we can use Grover without knowing necessarily all of the, the, the vertices ends up actually leading to a number of application is the element distinctness problem. And the basic idea of the element distinctness problem is you've got a pair of lists and you want to be able to determine whether the elements are distinct or whether or not there's an, uh, oh, there are overlaps. And so it's a little bit difficult to phrase that problem in terms of Grover's search. However, it's easy to, to think about it in this generalized approach using Zegedy walks. So it, it gets applied in that particular case. Um, other cases, involve, uh, for example, triangle finding. And so the idea basically is that, you know, what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to, if you've got a graph, then you may be interested to see, okay, are there triangles inside the graph and where, and where precisely are the triangles if they exist? So the triangle finding algorithm gives a polynomial speed up uh, similar to element distinctness for finding a, a particular triangle in the graph. Um, so that is, um, those are both applications for this, but I should also mention that there's other ways in which these walk uh, algorithms can be applied. Uh, one of the um, uh, important ones is that these can be used in order to implement Metropolis Hastings algorithms, which are, these are used frequently in Gibbs sampling and uh, uh, various other, other applications in optimization, for example. And this uh, basically ends up giving a um, quadratic speed up for the simulated annealing, which is an optimization heuristic that's, wi that's wildly successful for, for a number of, um, of different problems. So these are just a couple of the applications that are really useful for um, the uh, for the Zegedy walk. And I, I should also mention that there's other connections that end up coming up because the algorithm itself with these reflection operators that end up transforming the eigenvalues that we end up having for our transition matrix P 
into phases uh, in that, that partic this particular form, this can actually be thought of also as a quantum singular value transformation. So well, Zegedi's approach ends up generalizing the notion of, um, of Grover's search in order to be able to apply in cases where you don't necessarily end up knowing the even the labels of the, the elements that you're searching over. It also is actually just a particular application of the quantum singular value transformation as well. So that's just a little bit of context behind this. So thanks a lot. Next time, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about continuous time quantum walks and show a situation where by defining a um, our quantum walk differently, we can actually provide a, uh, an exponential speed up relative to the best possible uh, classical algorithm for uh, walking, a, walking a graph using a continu in continuous time rather than discrete time. All right. Thank you very much. See you all next time.